Shabbat Shalom and Gemar Hatima Tova. I know that last one still seems like a tongue twister, but trust me, if you practice it, you'll get good. But we only get to practice it for 10 days. Uh, that is to say, Gemar Hatima Tova is the traditional greeting that we do between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Uh, it is, of course, trying to uh, make it clear that uh, we think everybody was already righteous and so good that on the Day of Judgment, that was yesterday and the day before, Yom Hadin, the day of Rosh Hashanah, that God, of course, judged you for a good year. Now you just don't have to, now just make sure you don't mess it up. All right, so Gemar Hatimatova, may you be finally sealed for good. I assume that you've already been written for good. I just hope it gets finalized on Yom Kippur for maybe even better. So it's a very polite way of saying Happy New Year, and I don't think you need extra help because you're already such a great person. It's amazing how many subtle layers of consideration and psychology are built into our Hebrew expressions. Which is, of course, why I hope you have been paying attention to the other Hebrew expressions that have appeared in our liturgy during Shabbat Shuvah, and indeed during the entire days, the weekdays as well, there are changes to our prayer book. No, never let anyone tell you our prayer book doesn't change. Not only does it change seasonally, but these changes were added by different uh, members of our community in antiquity for exactly this purpose. So, what are the changes in our liturgy? What things happen differently during this Aseret Yemei HaTshuva, the 10 days of repentance between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur? Anyone notice anything in their service so far? I see a nod. Give me, give me something, David. What, what's a change? A couple of additions during the Shimona Esri. All right, excellent. Uh, turn to page 185, 186, and 187, but keep a finger on 184 because we've got all the major changes happening in just these few pages. All right, so let's, let's talk about the, uh, the ones that are very apparent. If we're on page 185 and we are in a vote, there is a little indentation, a full block of text that says Shabbat Shuvah, right? My, my book isn't the only one that has it, correct? Okay, and go ahead and give me just the English translation of what that line reads. The Zohreinu line. Hmm? Re and inscribe us in the book of life for your sake, God of life. Okay. Anybody detect a theme in that sentence? If you were going to do like a word count kind of uh, element? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, what, what's going on here? Life, life. <laughs> right? L'chaim. There's a reason why that is an expression in Judaism. Right? In this whole section about a vote, where we are usually focused on the amazing concept that the God of our ancestors is the God of us and that it transcends time and all of that, all of a sudden we say, yes, it's great that God protected our ancestors and that God will continue to remember them uh, into our day for our good, but we're also going to get a little bit more specific here. Really, it's about life, God. Please, right? remember our ancestors and then remember us in their honor, as well as hopefully some of our own, for life. And that we remind ourselves that God is the king that wants life. Uh, that, that may seem obvious to you, and if so, good, you are a well-trained Jew, uh, but that's not obvious in the antiquity, and it's not even obvious in the modern world, that the fundamental power of the universe is actually on the side of life and goodness. Judaism says, absolutely, this is what God is, and therefore, we can hope that God will deliver life, will deliver that fullness of existence to us. All right, so that's Avot. Turn the page. What do we have for Givurot? What do we weave in near the bottom of that prayer? How subtly the uh, author tried to mimic the, uh, the elements of the prayer that were already there. Everybody find a line in the bottom? Shabbat Shuvah, that's your code phrase, remember? Yeah, Judy, do you want to help me again? Sure. Uh, just give us the English, because everyone can read either, but we want to make sure we understand it together. Who is like you, source of compassion, who remembers with compassion your creatures for life? 
Who is like you? Right? Again, playing off the line that has just come before, repeating that line of that, that idea of who can compare to you, a common refrain in Jewish prayer. And then again, what are we comparing God to? In which aspect is it that God is non-comparable to the rest of existence, to God's uh, compassion, and God's love of life? Again, we come back to that theme again. So we are saying, what is God's might? Because that's what Givurot is about. It is about God's strength, but not just God's strength to wage war and make the skies drop water on us. We, we talk about those things a little bit. But fundamentally, the most impressive aspect of God is God's love of life and God's remembrance for us uh, of us for life. Everybody noticing a pattern here? OK, let's break that pattern and turn to the Kedusha. That's the next page. I'll save you the effort. Go all the way to the bottom. Right, the, uh, the chatima, the final phrase of the bracha, is altered for Shabbat Shuvah. Normally we say, blessed are you, Adonai, the, our holy God, or God of holiness. Here, for Shabbat Shuvah, we change out the word holy for the word king, king ruler, sovereign, uh, the one in charge of the domain. Pick your English analog. Uh, we swap out the word holy for king. Now, okay, hold on. We were doing life, 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 king. It's a little jarring in some respects because wouldn't I like, you know, God of life have been more in keeping with the theme of Shabbat Shuvah or, or, or maybe, you know, the holy source of life? I mean, after all, does, is king and holy? I mean, which one is better? Because I, I, I've read about a lot of kings, and we even have some still on the, uh, on the throne in the earth today, that don't seem very close to holy, and generally we conceive of holy as being superior to kingship. So why the sudden shift into king for Kedusha? It seems like a downgrade. Well, it's not a downgrade, it is a side grade. <laughs> All right, so this is the moment in the year when we are most acutely aware of God acting as a king in the sense that kings used to spend a lot more time judging things. The, the, the people of his kingdom come with a problem, and the king would sit, listen, deliberate, and make a decision. Uh, or maybe the nobles would come to the king or whatever might be going on. The decision-making aspect of kingship used to be a lot more prominent rather than the ceremonial, which is what most of us are familiar with today. And when we get to the end here, we are reminding ourselves of God's role as that king, as that decision-maker for, well, for life. You see, this is complementary to the concept of God as being the architect of life. Because what it is saying is that God is actually making choices about how life is going to go. But we're not saying that because we are thinking of God as being a capricious king of flesh and blood, the normal mortal kings, where, uh, as Mel Brooks once famously put it, it's good to be the king because you can do whatever you want. That is not the type of king that we are conceptualizing with God. We are instead conceptualizing God as a fair judge. And what does it take for a fair judge to make a good decision? Well, the involvement of the um, litigants, the people that are being judged. That is to say, a fair judgment matches fairly the true actions of that which is being judged, which means us. So we are recognizing that God is on the side of life. We are recognizing that God delights in life. We are recognizing that God wants life and goodness to be the foundation of the world. But we are also reminding ourselves in one little word change, but we're not going to get a free pass, that all of that is still bound up in us actually doing what we're supposed to do. That God is still a king. As much as God delights and wants to sing and dance with us in all of the wonders of life, God still has the job of making sure that justice is done, 
that right prevails, and that we guide ourselves in this life in the best possible way, which means we should be encouraged to do what is right. So this notion of king, as antithetical as it feels in the modern conception of rulership, is in fact part and parcel of what we mean by God as one that delights in life. It's because God delights in life that he gave us Torah. It is because God delights in life that he has guided us throughout our history. It is because God delights in life that he will tell us when we are wrong, like a loving parent will or a good ruler will, rather than following opinion polls, pointing out, you know what? <laughs> we, may, we may want this, but it's not good for you or the country. That's the sort of ruler that God is trying to be conceptualized as during this Shabbat Shuvah. But there is one other change. Flip back to page 184 that is most commonly noticed and, and, and heard. Page 184 at the bottom of the page, we are in the, uh, the Chatzki Kaddish, although this will appear in every Kaddish uh, throughout these 10 days. What's going on? La'ela, la'ela, right? To, uh, to give us a little tongue twisty, la'ela, la'ela. Right? So la'ela in general in the Aramaic is the rough equivalent of le'olam. Um, that is to say, forever. And in the Hebrew, you'll hear le'olam va'ed. In the Aramaic, you'll often hear the phrase la'ela, which can mean not just beyond, but um, like above and beyond. Uh, and in this particular case, in the original uh, normal rest of the year phrasing of the Kaddish, we are saying that God's great name is beyond, is above and beyond all the various synonyms for praises that we could possibly ever utter. That human beings are incapable of ever completely, accurately, fully describing God through our praise and adulation. On Rosh Hashanah and through Yom Kippur, we say beyond beyond, right? Double beyond double past our conception. Well, if, we already, if it was already impossible, how is it doubly impossible? Right, that, that, it's like double infinity, exactly. It, it, it feels mathematically disingenuous, right? It, it doesn't seem to be adding anything in terms of the structure of the sentence that was not already there in the prior formulation, uh, which is perhaps one of the reasons why we don't retain this throughout the rest of the year. But what we recognize when we see it, and when we recognize how it is putting this echo into the Kaddish, is it is reminding us of the same thing that the Kaddish normally tells us, but even more so because we are more likely to forget it during these days of the Yamim Noraim, these days of the High Holidays, which is to say, no, honest, really, I know you may think we just kicked all of our verbal praise of God up to 11, God is still beyond that. It's not just that God is beyond our, our, our verbal description when we're on a regular weekday service and even Shabbat, which is so much shorter, so many fewer words than what we say on the High Holiday Liturgy, but even adding in all of the High Holiday Liturgy, which we've only just got started with, wait till Yom Kippur, where it's almost every hour filled except for when we're sleeping, even all of that is still incapable of even beginning to approximate God's greatness. That indeed, we have redoubled our efforts, and our efforts remain inadequate, verbally. So what's left? If we cannot conceptualize God perfectly, cannot capture God adequately in our words, then what are we left to do? Well, we are left to go back to the other insertions, reminding ourselves through the notion of God's kingship and through the idea that God will remember us for life, that we should act. Our words are inadequate, absolutely. There is no book you could possibly write that would ever completely adequately describe God even to a tenth of one percent. But your deeds, well, your deeds, first and foremost, proclaim that you truly do understand and agree that God is king because you are living according to the rules of that monarch. But more importantly, those words, those deeds begin to take shape within your spirit in a way that words cannot reach. When you act, 
according to the mitzvot. When you allow them to be the texture of your life, you feel differently in your relationship with God and your relationship with the world and your relationship with yourself. And that means that for all the inadequacy of the words, we can cut through it with simple action in compliance, in obedience, in submission, in joyous celebration and fulfillment of the mitzvot. And nowhere do we see that better than on Rosh Hashanah, and we'll hear it again at the end of Yom Kippur, than the sound of the shofar. All the words pale in comparison to the call of the shofar. All of that incredible poetry that our ancestors have composed for us throughout our matzorim, which I do enjoy, still cannot hold a candle to the cry of the shofar. And we are reminded through all of these changes in our liturgy that ultimately they are not there to help us grab God and put him into a book, but they are there to help us remember what God truly is, what God truly wants, and to use them as signposts to walk in the way that God has to walk. That is our invitation to relationship with God through the fulfillment of the mitzvot. It's really quite a simple pro process and quite a simple concept, but one that easily gets overlooked through the minor variations that are intended large bells to ring our understanding in a different direction. So for this new year, pay attention to those little details and recognize the wisdom of our sages of trying to help us understand it's not actually about the words. The words are just there to point a direction, but you have to walk in that direction. However you have been walking in your relationship with God for the last year, find surer steps, find a quicker stride, find a more powerful closeness to that path, and you will find 5785 can be a year indeed where we hope and all delight in life. Shabbat Shalom and Gamar Hatimatovah.